Alright, so as you can see, uh, we're here to talk about logging in your PHP applications. Uh, my name's Klaus. Uh, you may recognize my nickname, Letharian, from Drupal.org. Uh, and so the background for this talk is that I've been I'm working at The Economist. We have started to move some services out from our uh, fairly large Drupal 6 site into separate services, some smaller applications that don't necessarily need a UI or uh, the editors care about. So we're building some uh, some smaller symphony applications from scratch and uh, we've been trying to to be picky then about how we uh, how we deal with logging so we can make sure we find errors ideally before they even uh, before someone else discovers them. Uh, <coughs> so most of the logging that, uh, or every, almost everything that I'll be showing here, and most of what we're doing is based on Monolog. So I'll just, how many people have seen Monolog or used it before? No one. So then it's, uh, then we'll show some of that. So Monolog, library on GitHub available in on packages, so you can use it with Composer, uh, is is simply the login library that we're using, and here you here you have very basic use case of that. Use the namespaces you need, create a new logger, and then push a handler to it. And so handlers uh, generally will be defining where your logs go. So the simplest one is, it, as in the example, a stream handler, which is just a, uh, a file path, and it's going to write that out to disk there. Uh, other handlers available. If we scroll down a bit here, you'll see you can send things to sockets, uh, new relic. I think there's a Redis one somewhere. <coughs> you can't see in the list right now. Uh, but you can get your logs to pretty much wherever you want. Uh, you can also do you can have formatters on them so you can treat your data in different ways uh, and get them output in the right exact format that you want. And then you also, when you instantiate the handler here, you tell it which is the lowest uh, error level that it's supposed to care about. So if this one's instantiated here uh, with warning level, if you pass it info, debug, or anything else below warning, that will be ignored and thrown out which is going to be important later in the presentation. Any questions on what we're seeing here? All right, then. Um, so it's, um, I've split this up in a couple of, um, you can call them techniques, I guess, to improve you, what, what you're logging. Uh, at least one of them will likely be familiar to everyone who's used Drupal for any amount of time. Uh, some of them are fairly simple, and we'll go through them quickly. And then uh, the last two ones are a bit more complicated. We'll look at some code and uh, see if there's any more uh, advanced questions about those. <coughs> so the first thing uh, is message identifiers, which is an idea that, uh, that I got from uh, something called uh, System D and Journal, which is uh, syslog for Linux systems. And so uh, the idea is here, you see I have, I have a log, I add an informational message to it, and I say this is a hard-coded piece of text in there. And then someone comes along and points out, well, this here's wrong, that's not one word, so, you ha so I have to split that up. And then as it turns out, I'm using this information for something important, so I have, uh, at, at The Economist, we write all of this information to Splunk. All, we gather up all our syslogs, get them into Splunk, so we can generate reports from, from the logs. But in a simpler case, you could just grep these files if you have them on disk. So I've copy-pasted this message from the code into some script I'm running, and I'm parsing these messages. And then when I correct this to insert the, that space there, then my, my simple grep is going to fail because the text has now changed. Uh, and of course, that could be, you could be rewriting the, the message completely and reorder words and stuff. You could do, have a much uh, 
larger change, or maybe the uh, output is translated and localized for your users, which makes that even more difficult. So, um, what we're doing in our application is we have a message ID kind of hard coded for the message. It also has a UUID, which I'll get to soon. <coughs> and then instead of hard coding the text into the application, we do we call get message with the ID that we want, which will output the UUID and the actual message. And then we know that we can always search for, if I want to find every instance of this message, whatever the actual text of it was, then I can search through Splunk and find every instance ever recorded whether we've changed the actual text message or not along that time. <coughs> and so the, um, uh, yeah, so here you have a sample output of what that might look like. The UUID part there uh, looks like fairly large and unwieldy, which is a little bit annoying. <coughs> But going back then to where, where I got this from, systemd, um, and journal specifically, which is a component of systemd, um, had this concept of specifically being able to identify the messages that, you do, uh, that you're seeing. So if you run journal and you have um, other messages from, uh, say, from Apache or PHP, some well-known error condition, then journal will actually be able to recognize messages based on their UUID, provided you log with uh, a UUID, and then give you a link saying that you have more information about this error over here. Uh, because it mean if you have for well-known applications and errors, it maintains a list of where where is there more interesting information to help you debug this. And uh, and I thought that sounded like an interesting idea, so. Uh, We've adapted that for our application. So that's the first thing. Uh, any questions or comments on that? All right, then we'll move on to the second one. And this is likely to look familiar for most of you. So in a lot of cases, when you do these log messages, you'll have some sort of context uh, around why you're doing it, and in in the example here, we have an event which is starting, which has some sort of title, TV, uh, concert, radio. In in here, then they get all of them get different UIDs, which again makes it harder than if I want to find every time a event started without caring about which one, then that will be much harder to find. So what you can do then. Um, in um, in monolog is provide variables and I'm sure you've seen that in watchdog because watchdog has the same thing you get the message first and you can have an array of variables afterwards so in we can then have a single ID for all of these messages one text and then monolog can either replace those for you into the text uh, or do as monolog does it, stick them, or as watchdog does it, you can have them separate them, uh, for example, as they're stored in, in the database in Drupal 6 and 7. So here you have, the first one is then what, what your log would look like if you just hard code the, uh, the events in there, and the second one is then what they would look like, or the, the later half is what it would look like if you were to use context as monolog refers to it. Uh, and so one, uh, one advantage of this that, uh, I mean, Drupal's probably, I'm guessing that was part of why Watchdog was designed to be the way it is, but I hadn't struck me until I was looking at this, is um, that uh, with this information separate, you can actually say, <coughs> if you have some weird error condition in your code, uh, you're calling this function, and for some reason that you don't really know in 1% of the cases, it fails in some weird way. And then what you could do is, if you have this information stored, you could parse those and see, is there one, a, a less common scenario, like less uh, uncommon 
input you have here, since you could sort, like, find me all of the events that have started and sort by occurrence of the context. And then you could say that probably this, this one uh, very unusual context here is related somehow to the error condition. Questions, comments? The main reason for the placeholders in Watchdog is for translatability. Why they, they ended up in ah, the yeah, place. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of tools that that kind of sorting unless you do manual. Right, no, there's none, there's none uh, as far as I'm aware of for, for like Drupal. Uh, but I'm thinking, so since we are storing the information in Splunk, then we have a fairly, uh, fairly powerful tool which we could use to split this up into the individual fields. and and say that. And, and I guess in Drupal's case as well, since we have the, uh, since you show them in the user interface, uh, if you didn't split this up, uh, I suspect you could find yourself with some sort of attack vector there. If I can have you log messages with, I could insert JavaScript there, and now because <coughs> those are escaped outside, that also protects you that way. All right, moving on to the next one. So request identifiers. If you have a, uh, a fairly busy site or application, you are likely to be getting lots of concurrent requests. And then if you, if you do lots of logging, then you'll end up with uh, all of these messages are going to be interleaved. And it's, it, depending on what, what exactly you're logging and how much, it may be very hard to see which, uh, in which order things happen, or rather, which log messages belong to which requests. So the, uh, the thinking here is that we... Um, let's scroll down here. In my very simple uh, case here, I'm just outputting a random number of times a message. And then if I run this a couple of times, it'll be very hard for me afterwards to say which of these messages came from which requests. If I'm lucky, then they'll be happening at different times, so I can separate them by that. But if they're happening at the same time, then that's going to be much more difficult. So here, uh, I don't know now, if you look at the, uh, it's running here, zero or two times. And then if all of them happen at the same time, then I, it's very difficult to say which came from where and how, why, why did they end up in the log. So what we did then, is that we take, I've simplified this a lot here, especially with the substrings, because um, the hash is very long otherwise. Uh, we serialize the request, uh, add the timestamp to it, so we different, so the same request coming in several times gets different uh, hashes. Uh, we store that in, in my example here, it's a static variable. And then you can see up here, that hash is output along with the message. So again, then when if you're searching through your logs and you're interested in what happened during this particular, you find one uh, message that's interesting and you want to know what happened otherwise during the same request, then you filter your logs for that particular hash and you have only the exactly the error messages coming from that particular request. So contrasting that to the previous example here, you now have two identifiers. One of them is, uh, is the message. And then to the left of that, you can see that um, from which requests they came. And so here they're interleaved. But it would be easy to filter for uh, 078, for example, and get only the four ones that come from that particular request. And of course, in, in this very simple exercise that's not very useful, but when you, if you end up with millions of rows of logs, then that becomes uh, more useful. 
Any questions? All right, then we'll move on, and then we'll get to look at some code. Opportunistic logging. So at some point, you have this weird bug in your code, and you can't really figure out what's happening. Has that ever happened to anyone? Anyone had a bug in their code? <laughs> And you're staring at the screen, you have no idea what's going on, you're saying this is impossible, couldn't happen. And so you start adding more and more debug information into this to try to work out what state was my application in when this whole thing blew up. <coughs> and so you have here, I've added some debug level information. And then you add, you add more and more to this, and then maybe you have problems later, so you start you add more debug messages someplace else, and sooner or later you have. Uh, I mean, either you will have to, you would have to go back and clean this up manually, or you end up with logging a lot of debug information, which is also going to uh, just pollute your logs because most of the time you're not really interested in that. And if um, I don't know what it works like. Uh, where you are, but I expect that if I were to add debug messages all over the place and start chewing up I.O. with my application, this is what my sysadmin would look like. <laughs> and then he would come after me with a knife. So instead of having to uh, output uh, all of this debug information all the time, uh, Monolog provides something called a, um, a fingers crossed logger. And I'll show you very uh, briefly here what that uh, what the concept's like, and then we'll look at some code for how this works. <coughs> so I've replaced what was just logged before with a, what's called fingers crossed or FX here logger. I add a debug message, then I check if the input here uh, is happens to be world. If so, I add a warning. Otherwise, I don't, and then I just print out hello world at Triple Camp London. And then I add a debug message again at the end. And so at the top here, uh, you'll see push handler, which is what we saw in the documentation from Monolog, where, I, where there was a stream handler initially. <coughs> The handler I push on to here now, though, is called fingers crossed handler. And that handler takes a, an argument of a stream handler, which is the original one, which is writing to disk. And then it takes a um, uh, stream handler takes a debug level argument. Fingers crossed handler defaults to warning. And so if I run this now, Uh, it just grabs the name from the argument, outputs that, and then first make sure I don't have anything old here. Remove that file. We run this a couple of times, and we'll see there's there's nothing in the logs. Doesn't didn't output anything at all, despite me having several. I do add debug, and I add debug, and nothing comes out. However, if I change this to world, hello world at Triple Camp London, and then I cat the log, oops, then suddenly I have output. And so the interesting thing happening here, oh, sorry, is that the fingers cross handler takes all your debug level messages, and at the end of the request, if you didn't have a warning, uh, which is a level you can change if you want, it just discards all of your debug information. So you pay a little bit of memory for storing that, but no I.O. On the other hand, for this one request where something goes wrong, I have all the debug information available uh, before anything went wrong. So I don't have to go back and figure out, like, here, roughly, something went wrong, and then you haphazardly start adding debug level information afterwards. 
but instead you have that available for that request only and you pay very little I.O. for that, some memory, um, but hopefully that can save you a lot of time in the future. Any questions? Presumably, therefore, there's a fatal error there. Um, that could definitely be the case if, also I, exp I mean, I guess that's an implementation detail of the logger, but yeah, if the fake error is before the debug, inf the warning happened, then yes, then that's never going to happen. Uh, hopefully though, it would flush the debug information as soon as a warning came up, so if you have the fake error afterwards, then you would still have everything from before. Uh, but yes, that's uh, most likely that would break this. Any other questions? All right, then we'll move on. And um, this last thing here I, that I found, I uh, have to say I didn't think this was possible to do in PHP at all without extensions. Uh, who has heard of the concept aspect-oriented anything, really? Two people? All right. Three? So I'll go over to uh, GitHub here, because the author of the library here has documented that very nicely and explained things better than I can. <coughs> so aspect-oriented programming as you can see, is an approach to cross-cutting concerns where the concerns are designed and implemented in a modular way, blah, 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 blah. Um, what this means for, for us in this particular case is if you are adding, uh, if, you, if we go back to the debug level uh, information, I was thinking when I uh, came across the fingers crossed handler that so I could start adding a debug everywhere to everything and have all the data. Uh, of course, that's gonna. You, it's a lot of work to just find all your functions and add starting function x, ending function x, uh, and then so a, a manually doing all of that, and b will sort of pollute your code with concerns that's not really what the function's supposed to be doing. So aspect-oriented programming uh, takes this out of the function that you're dealing with and allows you to specify that, for example, for this class, when a public function is running, first execute this. And then you can do the debugging there once, <coughs> and the rest of your code keeps running as if with, without knowing anything about what just happened. So if we go down and look at some of the examples here, you have a uh, application aspect kernel, which is a simple way uh, to just get this started. There's a function to configure AO AOP, which we will come back to shortly. In your front controller or wherever your, app your application is starting, you create an application aspect kernel, get instance. You tell it which source code to parse, and then also where it's supposed to cache its data. And then here's where most of the magic happens. <coughs> we implement an aspect, and then we have a public function before method execution. The name of the function is just descriptive, it doesn't really matter. Uh, just above the function, you have the before annotation, which is where the magic happens. And it says, before the execution uh, of any public method in <coughs> the class example. And then it'll execute the function you have here. Uh, so here it's just going to echo output directly to standard out which class it was called, which method it was and with which arguments. Uh, what I try doing then 
instead of just echoing stuff is I pass in the logger to here and I write at debug level I write out which this basically the same information what was called and with what parameters and uh, and then this finishes and then of course most of the time nothing happens with that information but should something go wrong then um, then I can potentially I, I mean you can apply this to if it's a small application you could in theory apply this to everything just do star dot star up there at the before and you'll have literally every single function call will be logged in your um, well, in your logs Right. There are. Let's see, did I? Sh oh yeah. So and the very last thing. So we have the aspect we're calling here before method execution. Uh, in the configure AOP function that we saw above, we instantiate this one, pass it in, and then this library here deals with with the rest. And um, I, uh, as I said before, I thought you would have needed an extension to PHP to make this happen. Uh, it just blew my mind, actually, that, that this just works. Uh, a word of warning is that it's not free in terms of performance. Um, in ve uh, my very simple test case, uh, and it's completely non-scientific, so don't take my word for it if you look at this and do your own measurements. but. Uh, increased running time by 15 or 20 percent or something. So uh, it's definitely not free. All right, those were uh, the five things that I meant to present. I have. Uh, I can make some other comments as well. But any any questions or comments? Anyone want to discuss anything related to this? Yeah. How would this um, integrate with Drupal? Is there a module that would replace Watchdog? Uh, there are actually already modules that do replace Watchdog. So um, one of them is the Gallup module, which is designed to work with Greylog. Uh, and instead of writing things to the database, it buys UDP packets of the Greylog server that you can nominate. So is Greylog similar to this, but a different sort of repeating? Greylog is a logging system similar to Splunk and uh, Monolog. Mm -hmm. Um, server-based, and uh, I'm pretty sure the Acquia guys use it because um, the Gelf module is from Mark Sonbeck. Um, it's, I don't think it's got a formal release, but it is being used in Cor in a lot of places. There's also Syslog in Core, uh, which is an alternative to DBLog, and that just broke Syslog. But yeah, the DBLog overhead is anything from sort of 10% on a, on a quiet site uh, we found one problem on one page, um, but because it was in a loop uh, and was calling dblog a lot of times, um, fixing one notice saved about 25 seconds on a page load. <laughs> <laughs> dblog is quite expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Greylog. So, um, so Monolog, which is what I've used to implement most of this. Um, it's really just, it's an implementation of the PSR3 uh, logger interface. And so you can, there is a handler for gray log, so you can have the logs pushed there okay. to that server. And Drupal 8 is designed to use um, PSR3 standard, uh, so we should see more of that. Uh, and I do have a sandbox module called Watchdog Advanced, which lets you configure a lot of things like the minimum. Um, it's not like, um, fingers crossed, logging, but it lets you minimum level that you want to log and to redirect some things to one logging place and others to another. Um, but it's, it's completely unfinished, so if anyone wants to take a look and play with that, um, patches. <laughs> In, in addition to that, so what I'm doing in, in our application, um, I would like to have some of the debug information there, four fingers crossed when there's a warning or anything, but during that time I also want to have, uh, if I do info level messages, then I would like to have those outputs without triggering fingers crossed. So I actually have a thin 
wrapper around that as well. So I have one normal logger, which reacts to information level. Then I have the fingers crossed, as you saw. And then I just pass in all log messages to both of them and let each of them figure out their own thing for which messages to react to and which to ignore. <coughs> Any other questions? So either everything was crystal clear or I made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, I'm uh, finished ahead of time, but uh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>